not a chess player, but has been extremely supportive. We just had a son, uh, and a son who's four months old, about to be four months old. Um, so I have a really supportive wife who is allowing me the chance to be on stream and to uh, talk about this book and have the time to work on this book. Uh, but the inspiration uh, outside of my wife, uh, also my parents, um, and uh, them introducing me to the game of chess. Uh, I'd also like to thank Uma and Foster Iyer, who were the first people who bought me my first chess board on December 25th, 1994, when I was three years old for Christmas. And that... uh, my coach, my very first chess coach, um, Al Walker. Uh, Al was the one who helped me get from thousands to about 1,500 and really helped me develop the love for the game and uh, realize that chess is something I really wanted to pursue and do for the rest of my life. And Elliot Neff, uh, the CEO for Chess for Life, for giving me the opportunity to teach children at chess, uh, teach children with chess in Seattle. And because of that, I am now working for the uh, Chess Emporium out here in Phoenix and uh, still keeping up on the coaching side. So uh, there are some people I definitely left off that list, but uh, those are the first few that came to mind that uh, I just absolutely have to thank. And obviously you, James, <laughs> for yeah. helping with the book and uh, do, doing the videos and doing such a wonderful job. So, um, yeah. Appreciate thank it. Thank you to, to everyone. Um, but yeah, uh, the book, uh, as James has said, is it's called Tournament Guidebook, Axioms, One Liner, Mantras. Essentially, the idea is um, a lot of times in chess, you'll hear from coaches uh, these ideas of like knights on the rim are grim, or don't block your bishops with center pawns. And I read this thing when I was younger. Until I was 1500, my coach Al Walker made me read before every single tournament game until I hit about 1500. He said, Read this 64 commandment by Bruce Penalpini, uh, which came from his book, ABC of Chess. Uh, really great book, by the way. That's nice, chat. Y'all hear that, right? Go grab that ASAPs. ABCs of Chess. Great book by Bruce Penalpini. And if you don't know who Bruce is, uh, it's a great author and great coach. He was the one, if you've ever seen from the 90s, searching for Bobby Fischer. He was the coach of that kid, Josh Waitz, in, in that movie. So um, great, great uh, coach as well and great player as well. And so I, I read that book and I would always, before every single game, until I hit about 1500, because at that time, this was 2000 to 2005, it wasn't really about studying opening theory before a game of preparing for opponents as I do now. It was really about just not forgetting key things that I had already learned and not blundering. And I think that's a big, big part of hitting the 1500 mark in chess is just not blundering and just not losing foresight of things you've already learned. If you stop hanging pieces, go hit a thousand is what I teach my students. Right. And as easy as it sounds, it's it's a lot harder to put in practice. That's right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's uh, that really is the number one thing to hit a thousand. If you want to hit a thousand, stop wondering. Stop, right. Stop hanging a piece. <laughs> that's exactly and, right. Um, that's uh, yeah. So that that all all the that's really what inspired it. Um, my coach Al, my my um, my um, studying of these these one liners, and I had never seen a chess book that was written in that manner. Um, I'm by my by the way, my my reading is about 2100. Uh, just hit 2130 uh, yesterday. Played in a first over the board tournament after COVID. Nice, and, that's USCF. Yeah. Yep, got okay. four out of four. 2130 so, USCF, nice big fella. Did what I was supposed Work. to do. <laughs> Good job. So, uh, yeah, working on getting the master title and then eventually going for the GM title as well, like Fancy, so I'll get through there. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, still got some work to do. But yeah, that's um, that's the that's the story of how kind of the book started. It was just because um, I was inspired by the book I read when I was younger and because I was inspired by my coach. Um, I just wanted to have the synthesis, and this really started with me more 
I don't forget the stuff that I have learned. I started building this for myself as a checklist of things I want to remember now as a 2000 plus rated player before I play my game. So I tried to take what Bruce did and put it on steroids and then also include actual game live positions that go alongside with it. Um, so I could actually review that. So the way I intend this book to be read is you actually read the book and you can kind of do it as a blog type or article type. You just kind of could read one single thing at a time and just taking it as it comes. So you don't have to read this book from beginning to end. You can just kind of take one snippet at a time. But right before the round, if you are rated less than, I guess, 1,800, 1,000 to 1,800 ELO, um, this is really the book for you where you just literally right before the tournament round, you would read the entire checklist, which is about 10 pages. Um, you would just read those one-liners and be like, yep, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it, and just kind of have a quick review. And that kind of sinking into your mind of having a coach in your mind, um, that helps. I mean, yesterday when I was playing my game, I remember a game saying, <laughs> saying a few things. So that uh, that also helps me play my game. So some, some of the things that James says, uh, that, that kind right. of like came into came into my mind. I, I heard the voice. I heard the voice of the Jedi. Yeah, that's right. The Jedi is always there. Absolutely. I hear that all the time. Thank you, Lady Lowski, for five months. Yeah, Vishnu Warriors here today, Lady Lowski. Let's get a big shout out to the man Vishnu Warriors here today, guys. Lady Lowski with a five piece. Thank you so much. And also, and thank you for the sub. Thank you for the sub, Lady Lowski. Thanks for the five, girl. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, yo, big shout out to Vishnu Warrior here, guys. Uh, he's here talking about the book. Make sure uh, we also recording this. So this is going on YouTube. So you guys can go check it and replay it back and forth. So he tells you, of course, the, the rating range, what's in it, why he made it and things like that. That's a five piece. Lady Lowski, thank you so much. All right, bro. Let's move to these questions, bro. Let's get to it. So we got, we're going to start with these 15 rapid fire questions, right? Okay, now, of course, it. it's going to be 15 questions real quick. We're going to talk to this new warrior right now about it. All right, number one, and this is for you too in the chat, guys, of course, as you can answer after you hear his answer. If you could buy any type of food right now, what would you buy? Pizza. Pizza. Okay, that's pizza. What kind? What kind of pizza? Oh, pesto with chicken, sun-dried tomatoes, and uh, some barbecue sauce as well i'm kind of weird i like yeah that's definitely pizza a strange pizza like that was yeah just but gross. i i really this, like the yeah. pesto and barbecue Although, yeah bro this is a weird. family channel bro let's just get to the next question don't even do that again number two what is your what is your color toothbrush blue blue okay mine's red give me a big old burrito we got brisket okay chad going crazy if you could be any animal what would it be and why lion because i'm a leo and the Leo, the lion says, Grr. that's the only thing I remember from chemistry. And Ben Fine goes, I think it's uh, lose, lose electrons is oxygen, gain electrons is uh, re reduction. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Don't remember that from 11th grade, grade AP fella. chemistry. Sheesh. Number four, what is one thing, one of the things you will put on your bucket list? Uh, skydiving or bungee jumping? Uh, both. I, okay. I haven't decided, but okay, both. both, right? Who is your favorite superhero and why? Superman. I uh, okay. I always wanted to wanted to be the best at whatever I did. Mine is the Hulk because that's just my whole style. Hulk, bro, just straight Hulk. You can't stop me ever. Number six. Who do you admire the most? My dad. Um, my dad is definitely the one person I'd have to say, like, just, I don't know. When, uh, when I was younger, my, my dad started a risk, started his own company and didn't work out at the time. And then he, he made it back. And uh, seeing that, like, unyielding will to fight to create a better life for himself and his family. Um, yeah, I, I want to do that myself. That's awesome right there. Ops, right? Pops is always a great, great one to go with. Me too. Hulk Thanos, no one's in location. Okay. We got a lot of questions in here. In fact, I'm going to just uh, scroll through because these are fun. Who's your favorite cartoon character and why? I have not thought about that question, but um, I have always liked Dexter from Dexter's Lab. Okay. I always thought it was a great cartoon and I always liked how he was uh, intelligent and 
dealt with Didi and her antics. So like they, yeah, oh, yeah, that's good. The only one I can think of is honestly Bugs Bunny because he was just clever. He was just always clever, bro. He was just always outsmart the dude. True. That's kind of my favorite summer activity. Play chess. <laughs> Thank you. Easy. I mean, that's kind of easy there. Um, right. But yeah. Um, although I live in Arizona, so my favorite summer activity is hanging out at the pool with my family. Um, it's just, I don't know. It's, it's really nice out here. Although summer is 110 degrees, the pool is awesome. Any chance of a chess bowl course to compliment your book? I did see Chess Dog Fan come with this question. Mm, uh, that's yes, a pretty good question. This will be in the works um, at least minimum a year from now, to be honest. First step is to get the book published. Uh, I will get to that point that I have found a publisher. But um, yes, I want to focus on getting the book published at first, and then Chess Bowl will be next. That's a great yeah, question. It's, all right, let's go with uh, a few more here. What is your favorite song? There and Back by Wolfgang Gardner. Okay. That is literally my, that is the pump up song. I play like literally before every single tournament, I will listen to that song. I have, I remember I listened to Apple Music one time and I plugged in my phone and I like looked at my most played songs. That, <laughs> that was song it. was played, that, was, that song I have played over like 1200 times. Jeez. The next most famous song next most popular song was the um uh, song uh exposure by Garrett Emery. like those are the two songs i will literally play before every single tournament and i'll just have and just be late i'm in, just turned up just like ready to work. that's it all right so three more well, number one what's your favorite opening in chess is white and it's black white. and it's black because uh crystal ex exc in the chat says what's your favorite opening in chess as white so we're gonna go with white but we might as well add black in there too um I really like playing against the French. I think the French is garbage. And like, sorry, all the French garbo. players, but um, hot garbo. I, I don't. I don't believe in crushing your CA bishop um, on move one. And uh, yeah, sorry, Von Cloud is not in that list. He but he but um, yeah, the French is something I just don't believe in as a strong opening for Black. I think there, there's something better for black to play. Uh, so I enjoy playing that. As oh, well. Right. And against yeah. black, real quick, thank you, Gene ZB, for the two months in advance. I appreciate you, bro. Thanks for that sub. Yo, what's uh, the next one for black? The favorite one as black is to play the... Um, I really have started liking to play the Albin Counter Gambit. Oh, black. wow. Albin Counter. It is very, very sharp and good as a blitz opening. Yeah, uh, in fact, let me add you to an analysis board right now so we ahead of time here and show the chat what that is real quick on the analysis board because they're not going to know. Some people don't know. So I want, uh, here, let me add you. What is it? Vichy is number one, right? Yep. And then uh, show the chat real quick what you're talking about here. You in the uh, live chess? Yes, I am on chess.com slash live. Live chess. You should have got that notification. Let me send you another one. Vichy is number one. Uh, there you go. Yeah, so show the chat what you're talking about. So this is the opening from the side of the black pieces, where black plays this move, e5. You can draw arrows. The best too, move is to take the pawn and black plays e4. Um, there are many ways for white to play here. You can play white plays Three then c six and then there are a few main moves here. One is g three, second is knight here, and last is a three. I'm not going to go beyond that because I don't want to. Away that's, that's some that's stuff but there. Yeah. This is the uh, this is the blitz opening. I do not want to give away the main line, but if I put you in the chest, you may see this. You may get caught with a with a two piece or something. He's just said so. All right, now next uh, last last two. We got two more. What's your dream car? Dream car. Um, I don't have one actually. I'm okay. not a, really a car person. Okay. Uh, no, I would know I, if I actually had to pick one, it would be a night between a 1963 and a 1967 Jaguar E. That's fire. That's fire. I'm Lambo all day, Huracan. 
Lamborghini. Thank you so much. My doors go up. Thank you. So I do like a Lambo. Now, last question here. If you could teleport, where would you go and why? Uh, That's a fire one. Teleport, where would I go and why? Hmm. That's a fire Great one. question. I would really want to go to Gibraltar. I okay. really want to play the Isle of Man tournaments. And Gibraltar just looks absolutely beautiful. Um, I mean, the rock and everything. I mean, it just looks like paradise. That's fire. Uh, Some place that, that is the place I would go to. I would be, I would teleport literally wherever Magnus is, right next to him. <laughs> I want to be right next to him, literally right next to him, asking him questions all day long. That's exactly where I would teleport. Hey, is, Not even thinking twice awesome. about it. Yeah. Not a bad place to be. Yeah, um, that's exactly where I'm going. Can't change my mind. So, uh, all right, bro. Cool. Those are the questions there. Nice stuff. Now, we got some games, man. We got some games of yours, right? Some stuff we're covering today. So, tell us a little bit about what we're looking at. Yeah, so uh, there are a few games I wanted to show you. So, the first one, and some that's of these tactic. will be in the book. That would be cool. Some of them are not in the book. Uh, so the first one is a tactics position. So James is going to pull it up. But, yeah, I'm pulling that. Um, right now. This is the best tactic I have found in a game. This was an online game, so uh, it's a miniature. I won in those, but uh, this is the best game I have played, at least in terms of online. Although I did actually blunder in the opening, <laughs> but uh, I somehow managed to swindle my way, and I think. That's something really important that um, Coach Al taught me and uh, just one thing I've learned as I kept playing and playing and playing. It's like, and this is also one of the quotes in the book. No one ever won a game by resigning. Mm, that's right. No one ever won a game by resigning. And this is, you know, I, the game's up. The game's uploaded. So, you know, you can do your thing here. You want to go through the entire game or we want to do the ending or how you want to do it? Yeah, yeah, we can we can skip to the ending. So uh, I will flip the board. Maybe we'll there. fast forward through some of the moves just to see what the opening was. Yeah, so this was a French, and uh, it was e4, e6, d4, d5. And at this time, I played the exchange and played this line with c4. Wow, so, exchange French is gross. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I, know, I know no one likes playing this line, uh, but uh, the point of c4 was... Um, Back when I was a kid, so this is back in 2004, 2005, uh, there was this chess program called Chess Master 9000. And in that, there was the, um, there were a few lessons by Josh Waitzkin, who was the kid from the Searching for Bobby Fisher mm -hmm. movie. So Josh Waitzkin was an international master, and he was talking about how he used to play this move C4. And so because of that, that's all I knew how to play at the time. And so okay, that makes I sense. never bothered to study opening, anything else. I just, yeah. I just played this. So I started playing C4 and took it from there. So knight C6. And I knew knight C6 isn't the main move. Usually it's knight of 6 and, or, or something. C6, like that. yeah, and usually C6. C6. And I just, without thinking, played knight C3 and wondered immediately oh. the spawn on C4. Wow. Um, face block. So, yes, and when you block like this, uh, you just gotta realize okay, obviously, don't trade queens. Like, when you lose a pawn and you're down material, don't trade, don't help your opponent. So, I played queen e2, played queen e5, which was natural, and I played bishop here. Beautiful, I like it already. Castle queen side, see what we got. So, yep, knight f3. And I was thinking at this point, okay, I'm gonna play knight f3, I'm a castle queen side, I'm gonna put this other rook here on e1 at some point. I and got go everyone crazy. aiming, and something should happen. So bishop e6 to trade some pieces, which makes sense. Knight f3, takes, takes. And now here you play queen f6 with the intention of guarding this pawn. So that way when he castles queen side, at least the pawn is guarded because. If you castled on the last move, this pawn would be hanging. Um, and that's something I've seen like a lot of my students who are between the thousand to like or even 1200 range and lower, they'll forget that stuff is guarded by something. Like they'll play a move, they'll be like, oh, I forgot that my king or something else was guarding that. And a lot of chess, right? Chess is like economics. That's what my nature was in college. It's like 
sometimes you will always gain control. Like literally every single move in chess will gain control of something, but you always lose control of something else. And that pawn is not going to be guarded if you move the king and castle. Like, yeah, you gain castling rights, but you do hang the pawn. So black lead, queen f6, but this loses time. Castles. Now you can't castle because the rook prevents that. Bishop d6. Rookie one, bringing the last piece. Bro, this looks nasty. Uh-oh, here it come. And Bishop g5. Okay, Bishop so G5, everybody, everybody is everybody is working together. Sheesh. All pieces are developed. Both rooks are in the mid center. Bishop is doing great on g5, attacking the queen. Queen g6. It's a party. And now, knight d5, right? Oh, so yeah. now we're going to attack that knight. f6. All right, Ben Feingold is real happy now. Is not supposed to play f6 for good reason. Bishop f4. Yeah. And now black white castle is long, and this is where I leave it to you. What is the winning move for white? Oh, chat, go ahead. 100 face blockage right here. Cambodian natural. Y'all know what time it is. Send a stretcher. Come on, chat. It's too easy. It's too easy. Come on. Stop playing around here. Get this man off the board. Get him off the board. Why to move, chat? What do you do? Wow, y'all slow. Wow. So you don't have a move. Is that what y'all saying right now? Y'all just stomped. Knight takes e7, and I punch Devin. Stop. Who is Devin, first off? Then the Master Clendry. Secondly, it was terrible. It's terrible. Knight takes knight from Lethal Sleeper. It says knight takes knight. Anybody else? Knight takes knight. Okay. So 97, that's what you're saying. Wow. Yeah, he's saying knight 97, yeah. I think he's referring to mix master, says furry footed. Well, what do you got? We got knight b6 check? Knight b6? I think you're going off the deep end there, Savage. And Savage, like, you know, that that's a strange one, Savage. I don't know what you're trying to do there. Knight b6 is not a move, in fact. What's your follow-up? Savage, like after knight b6, like take it. What is your follow up? You gotta have a good follow up there. Now, I like rook takes knight from lethal sleeper, bishop takes bishop, remove the defender from Dr. Chainsaw, bishop d6 from chess owl, bishop takes bishop from crystal. Okay, y'all starting to be everybody starting to, they starting to get hot in the chat. Okay, so what do we have? Vishnu. So, yeah, naturally, naturally, yeah, you have to look at all your boards again. Right? Text captures and threats. So the first move that came to mind was that takes you seven. Now the question was, uh, okay, they can take with both pieces. And this is something like this is something that is the biggest reason for chess blindness, uh, at least in my opinion, is sometimes you'll only look at like one capture, but you forget that actually two pieces are able to take you. And you should always look at both ways for all three or four or whatever ways they can take you. Um, as simple as that sounds, it's like the biggest reason that people miss stuff. Like, so if I guess even Bishop takes, uh, what would the next move be by White? Chat, what you got? Come on, hurry up. Fast, fast, fast. You got to do this quickly. Quickly. Why are we training these hyperbolic chambers every day? Come on. You know how we do. What do we do, chat? Let's get it. Very quick. Pop the bishop, says furry. Put it. Nerf herder. Rook takes e7. Dr. Chainsaw with rook takes e7. Yeah, that looks like a very, very promising move. Now, obviously, if knight takes, there is queen because of, oh, misfire, not queen c6, but queen yeah. c7. Right. Uh, so that would be me. But just because you take them, and this is another axiom from the book, right? Just because you take doesn't mean they have to take you. Instead, he could throw this check in and takes, and then suddenly throw in like queen d1, and then chaos ensues, right? Now my king's in danger. This it's, pawn will be hanging after king moves, and that is just it's, it's unnecessary. It's just extra, right? It's just extra. So that, that gets too complicated for no reason. And if knight takes, even, that was another idea. And once again, rook takes might be possible. 
because uh, if bishop takes, the bishop is overloaded, protecting c7. But then maybe we could take just take on here. f4. Yeah, you just take on f4 take, and then take on d1, and then, take again, and then just you know it's chaos. White's still winning, check. but there's a lot of chaos still. So taking on e7. The, Either way of capturing was still chaos. Uh, taking on d6, I think after rook takes, black is simply fine. Uh, and so that leaves uh, knight b6. Okay, check is not checkmate. I think they'll just inspire take with a pawn and be fine. So that leaves the last forcing capture, which is Speak. rook takes. And that is the winning move. And Nasty. this is the winning move because if knight takes, now we take with check, we fork, right? The queen sit, the king sit, and if you take, you let go of that square. And the same thing happens with bishop takes, knight takes, check. Once again, you hit those two pieces. And if you take with the knight, that allows mate on that square. Hit that man so, with move. Very nice. Rookie seven. Uh, that would be the best tactic. GG. Thanks, Evolve Yourself. Appreciate it, bro. I'll be on tomorrow, too. I should be on with on Hikaru's channel tomorrow, too. If not, then I'll be on the next day, but... Appreciate you, bro. Thanks for watching. That was a nasty tactic by Vishnu Warrior. Rook takes e7. Sheesh. Right? Wow. And what do you have to say to the chat about that, Vishnu? Uh, I have to say study your tactics because that will be important when we look at example four and how that relates to a tactic I actually found in a real game. Okay, let's... I and... But, uh, All right. Before that, we'll go on to the next one. Next one says best missed win. So tell us a little bit about that as I upload this. Yeah, so this game was a game I played against Back Grandmaster Grand. Tejas Bakri. Uh, so Tejas is from India. I played Tejas um, in the 2015 Dallas P-Day tournament. So I used to live in Dallas back in 2015, and I played Tejas in the tournament. And one of the best things about living in Dallas is I got the opportunity to play many IMs and GMs because uh, all these strong players would go to UTV and play in the weekend tournaments. And at the time, I was working with Grandmaster Leonid Kritz, who was my coach. Uh, so Kritz was teaching me this particular opening in the classical Sicilian, which I knew they just played, and I prepared this against against Aegis, Um And I needed to play Bishop G5, E6, Queen D2, A6. So this is the main line castles and bishop d7. And so I, I'm not going to go too deep into the theory here. There's a few main lines here, but uh, the main move, I guess nowadays, is to play f4. But at the time, I was playing f3, which is the uh, English attack type of... Very English attack is, yeah, Nidorfies. Yeah, Nidorfs. Very, very g4, h4, g5, h5. I just didn't really want to king type and mm -hmm. stuff. Bishop d7. A4, protect the bishop. D5, okay, black goes for it. G4, and C castle. And very common in these positions is you need to drop this bishop back. The point of the bishop on G5 is sometimes you may take on G5 to damage the pawn structure, but now that uh, I'm going a little fast, but you're, you're thinking sometimes to take and make black take with the pawn. But now that this bishop's already here, if I ever take, you'll just take back with the bishop and not really damage. Pawn structure, so you got to drop this bishop back in order to start getting the pawn going, which is what takes. And here, I knew actually studying with Chris this idea of queen d4, and the idea is in many positions to go queen to b6 and exchange off the queens and play with um, this queenless type of middle. So you put a queen a5 and then play queen b1. This kind of fine always here to play queen b1 to defend the pawn. In opposite side castle, you got to defend this pawn and make sure your king is safe. So, yeah, I played this before king, and now the knight rotates over to e2. Now I'm thinking, okay, maybe knight f4 or knight g3 to go over to the king side. e5. Uh, this was a moment, as soon as we played this turn, I was really happy. I was really happy when I saw this turn because I think, yeah, you're attacking my queen, but that queen is really good. And here I played queen b6 to trade for king. And now this bishop's just showing on this square controlling d8, which is important because it's going to be hard to get a rook here to play g5. 
And I have the simple plan, 93, 9F5, my net will go on F5, except that, except that. And if you ever take, I will take that with a con and open up your C file. A lot of arrows there. Bishop E6, 93, E5, G5, taking your knight. And it's very important this knight's on G3, so now you can't play knight H5 to try to come into F4, but instead you have to go backwards to defend to attack my bishop. I take, so now if you take things here, I take you on here. E6. Or do the double right. your pawns. Right. So, tip on D5. And intermediate move. Musicians of. You don't have to take, just because you can take something doesn't mean you have I to. Right? Five. I Sheesh. That's a big problem. I have five. That's now, a big boy move. This is, this was a very difficult and important thing for me because obviously you can take here. But if you take here, I'm crashing through with rook b7, and yes, you can take this rook, but this bishop's still ahead. And all my pieces are on your half of the board. You may have heard from James, right? Like one through four is white side, five through eight, black side, like if they're on your side, they gotta go. You gotta get them out of there. Got, got two. And that's right. Yeah, I'm about to have three. All, all this stuff is hanging. This is nuts. There's so many pieces hanging right now. It's ridiculous. Rookie eight. Bishop a5. It's crazy. I didn't three is actually hanging. realize until after I looked at it with the engine, but apparently this was the absolute like best move. Yeah, and that is. In the, fact, that is. Yeah, I'm looking at the engine right now. Bishop a5 is great. And then after it takes on 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 f3, you can just take on d7, and you 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 doing great here so with all the activity. We reached this position that okay, if you take on h1, I take on h7, but you play bishop b8, bishop b4, h. Bishop C4. Sheesh. So, I remember at this position, I think it was a game night. It was a game night with the 30 second anchor match. So I had about 35 minutes left at this position, but he had over an hour left on the clock. And he went into the pink thing at this point. And he spent 30 minutes on the second row, rookie six. 30 minutes on rookie six. Dang. It's plus and four right now. Crazy. I did not find the correct move. So I will show you the move I played. Uh, the move I played was ninety six with the idea of attacking this pawn. And yes, oh, I that's gross. Everyone, can, yes, you may all see that, and I obviously saw this. But you need to calculate after it takes. What's the follow up? And I'll tell you now, Bishop e six is the correct move. It is the correct move to take and takes. Yeah, this whole line was nasty. I mean, this was ridiculous. This whole this line right here is insane. If you find this most... right here, oh yeah, you 2700. If you find this right here, you are 2700. Okay, no engine work. I want you to find the line. If you find it, go ahead, deem yourself 2700. Go ahead. White to move. Now, wait, you might find the first move, but what's the follow up though? What's the follow up? Let's let the chat think on this one. She got chat. When you're ready, put it in the chat. When you got it, put it in the chat. A lot going on. A lot going on, chat. We got a few options. Rook takes g7 and offer a draw so you don't mess it up. Since <laughs> Phantom has a <laughs> Just take on g7 and be like, you know what? Draw. Hey, you want to draw, bro? Knight takes g7 from Lethal Sleeper. We got Rook takes g7. We have Knight takes g7. It looks like we take it on g7. All right, Vishnu, what is it? Might as well take the pawn with the Knight. If Rook takes g7. Now, it is Rook g7. Now, if we take with a knight, um, I have not thrown this onto the engine. But uh not really sure what the best move is. Yeah, it's not best. But... Just to get the Rook off d7. Bishop c6. It's not good. This isn't uh, that good. Yeah, you just like, it just looks worse. Rook d6, yeah. probably Rook c8 defending. I got the two bishops. I mean, it's playable. 
It's very playable, I think. Still a game. It's still, still a, game. a game. Yeah, it's still a game, but that's not that's not the best. Rotates G seven. Well, Gotta go King H eight. Like, did not see. Boy. So I saw this part. This is well, the move right is... here. Guys, you find this. This is the move I'm talking about. Rotates G seven, anybody can find. You find this move and the sequence, the idea behind it. Oh yeah, you twenty seven hundred. Yeah. Easy. Easy twenty seven. Root G8 check from Dr. Chainsaw. Knight H6. Okay, he's just going crazy. He just out here going crazy. He just made he just calling all the moves out. Root G8, Knight H6, uh 97, uh take on H7. He just calling them all out. Bishop F8 with the knight follow up Rook G8 anchorish. That's yeah, something. Something. All right, here we go. Bitch, no, show it to him. What is it? This is ridiculous. Bishop C3. Okay, I take on F5. And now we take your. Speak. Uh, this, Bro, this is what? The axiom, from the, book, mm -mm -mm. But the axiom for this one is the bishop on the long diagonal is like a sniper in the bushes. So if you think of a sniper, right, they are long range. They are able to attack from far, very, very far away. And this. Uh, Actually shows the idea of the bishop being on the long diagonal as a sniper. For example, yeah. Yeah. Um, if the main threat is rook g6 for me, that's the main threat. If black plays h6, we don't take, but instead we play g6, shutting the door against this king, and the threat is now rook h7, king here, and rook h8 maybe. Gross. So H6 unfortunately doesn't work. If black plays bishop c7, tempting me to take this with check. In fact, the best thing is to not take this bishop, but instead drop the bishop back on the diagonal. My goodness. Once again, threatening this bait. Beautiful. And this is the computer line. Bishop a5, and now the double x plan move. B4. Oh my goodness. Ass out. Wow. After tempting B4. The and then hit him, hit him, Vishnu, hit him with it. Oh, no. oh you know, that ain't oh, it. No, I went that down. ain't it. I went nah, hit him that with it, Vishnu. That was the game nah, big fella, hit him with that move. That ain't it. It would be the move. Oh, Bishop my goodness. To A1. This is a family channel. Look at that. Mm -mm -mm. Bishop A1 after B4. Sheesh. Yeah, you 2700 at least if you found this. After Bishop A1, the hilarious thing is that this black bishop on B4 has blocked this own check from the rook. So he doesn't even have a decent check here. And like literally, there's no decent move to stop rook D6 from happening. Sheesh. Uh, I obviously did not find it. That was <laughs> nuts. Like, yeah, he didn't find it. it. Well, I wish he had like played by Gabe for me. <laughs> because, <laughs> man, this been awesome. Oh my goodness. This to play this? Uh, this was actually, I think, the first time I played GM over the board. Yeah, something about when you play a GM over the board, you just you just become better, just out of nowhere. But anybody else, you just play regularly. When you play a GM, you always just be playing your best chess for somehow, some way, it just comes out of you. And that's uh, that's, that was good, bro. That was very good. But this didn't, this wasn't how it went. This wasn't the game. Uh, you, I will quickly go through how I got distracted because that also is instructional on. How to come back and call your way. And I think this is why, like, GMs and just like anyone that's higher rated than you, just they have a higher rating for you than you for a reason. And like, after 96, he punished me. Like, as he was about to, with P7, he did what he was supposed to do. Create the most active piece of your opponent, which is my rush. I took, I played Bishop E8, trying to like hold things together, and after H8, that's a wrap. That's a wrap. And 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 that's uh you just went out slightly uh mic wise mic check
Microphone. There you go. That's a little better. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I turned I turned him up, Alex. Okay, so yeah, that was a tough one. That line was insane. I ain't never seen anything like that in my life. That was a very beautiful bishop dance, and then putting it on a one. Beautiful there. That's good stuff, bro. That's good stuff. What we got for number three? Number three, I think, would be the best miniature. The best miniature. So tell us about this miniature. Yeah, so this was in 2018. Uh, I was playing in a tournament. What's this guy named? This is Zeigler. Okay, let me uh, let me get that. So this was the San Diego Open. I can't remember the exact name, but um, I know it was the San Diego that it was uh, in 2018. And uh, this was the final round. So actually going into this round, uh, it was in the U2200 section. I was playing George Zeigler. I had four and a half out of five, so I played a pretty solid tournament. Or, yeah, four and a half out of five. Or three and a half out of four. I can't remember. One of those. I'd only draw in one game. Uh, but this was the last round I was playing. So I had a very, very good tournament so far. Um, and if I won this game, I, I was thinking to buy the last round because I had to drive back at the end. Um, if I won this game, I was at least playing for first. And before this game, like, one of the things that I did not learn until way, way later, until I hit 2000. And like, I wish I had learned this like even earlier. You have to prepare for the comments. Like, you have to look them up. Like, that's Dan right. Talks about this all the time. He's like, big facts. You have, he looked up a wonder Liang. Like, he looked at his games. He saw what line he plays. Like, I have completely not done this, and it's only thanks to um, Chris Tulin, who is a national master in Dallas. Uh, so, shout out to Chris for introducing me to this idea of like researching people that that changed my life and so i actually researched george before this game and i found out in one of the blogs he had written some chess articles and he wrote a blog saying like i hate playing against this variation of the duck i had never played this before in my life so what did i do in the 30 minutes before the game i looked at this variation and tried to prepare as deeply as possible so yeah, sometimes you take a risk playing an open you've never played before, but like he openly said he doesn't like playing this. So obviously I was like, all right, well, I'm gonna play this. So this is known as a spot and gambit. Um, yeah. At the time I was playing Bishop F4, I was playing to London. And I was then playing Bishop E5. But I knew wait, if you played the Dutch, all right, fine. I will play this spot and gambit. Um actually right now I am a E4 and E4 player, so I didn't even play the spot, and I was like, all right, fine. Uh, you play the Dutch, I'll play the spot. So the take, and the three, I got that on, got it at six, bishop g5. And here, uh, it's very important that black plays in my g6, because this is the best move. Um, this is not a good move. There is actually a tactic here for white that leads to a. Oh, yeah, I remember this. I used to study. I used to study the black side of this. And so, I got some good games and some bad black, games know why this is not good chat what do you do what do you do is white to move is white to move also vishnu if you can bring your mic slightly closer to you if you're able to do that all right am i better i just turned my volume as that that possible. works too yeah they love that they love that let me turn you down over here perfect cool all right chat is uh this is a famous dust trap in fact white to move what do you do about this What's up, Quiet Pills? Why to move? Quick, quick little, little bang bang, pop pop. Queen F3, that's for me. Stop. Man, the master clenching. Don't even do it. That's not for you. That's not, in fact, that is for you. That's exactly for you. <laughs> that's Queen for George. <laughs> Stop it. I've had someone play F6 to me and I lost. <laughs> Not sure if that's the move. You mean bishop takes f3? Oh, f3. You mean f3 right here. f3, that's a move. It is possible. And you've lost to it. You was probably playing black. Yeah, f3. It, it, it speeds up his development, especially if you take it. But that's not it. Take the knight and fork the pawn, says Dune 1. Wow. What do you say about that, Vishnu? He is right. He is right. Take the knight. You take. And it doesn't really matter which way you take with. Uh... Probably he takes his less bad, but yeah, you can play queen f5, you hit the king, you hit this pawn, 
Sure, G6 is playable. We'll take. Amber takes, takes. Okay, now you're hitting that pawn and you're hitting that pawn. I mean, and white is just better. White is just better here. So, right. playing this is not good for black. This is a common trap. Um, so, black should play knight g6, which I knew was the best move. And I've seen him play this before. He played uh, uh, d5 is the main line, knight e5, queen e4, knight f7. So, I have seen a few games. Actually, there was a game by Tanya Sepsi that she played this. Uh, she's an international master, and I think she works for Best Case India. But I've seen her play this before. I remember in one of her streams that she was playing the Scott and Gambit. And I knew up to this point, and here the main move is to take the knight. But there is this spicy a4, which I was like, OK, why not? I will play this move. And I looked at this dude at just days at the time. I had prepared this line and saw this was the second most popular or third most popular move. And I thought, OK, this at least keeps more pieces on the board and keeps attention. And I figured my opponent would not be as prepared for the for this move. And since uh, this keeps it more complicated, I felt a little bit more comfortable playing. So I played h4, g6, which is the main move, I believe, and castles long. Queen d6, and here, now I took the knight. So obviously, if queen takes queen, I'm happy I'll take back, win a piece. So black should take with a pawn, uh, and you don't want to take this way and allow check. So pawn takes, this way b takes, and now queen takes. And here, if Black really wants to go for it, yeah, he could take the pawn. Right. Black should take the pawn. Uh, Black should take the pawn. And at this point, I'm probably playing knight f3 or and just continue developing and just try to play this position with the fact that my pieces are developed and Black's are not. But Black played bishop h6 check, which allowed f4. And here now he played queen f2. And at, at this point, and that's look. He looking crazy. What is he doing? This is just looking too slow, trying to hit this pawn, but now Put this man off the board. Here, right. Guarding. Knight is 3 back. GG. Get this man off the board. Bishop E2. And now Bishop E2. Bishop so H5. The bishop's going here, Stuart, like pinning that knight, A5, and like he's just down like 13 points in material, unfortunately. Like Gross. those pieces are just not participating. And now. Bishop h5, getting the knight to the king. b5, okay, so he's trying to get some type of attack against the king, but this is just too slow. And that's really important, like, here that you don't freak out as white that, like, this pawn avalanche is coming. Like, that takes at least three moves. One thing you should never do in these type of positions is play a3. This is a real important aside, but, like, if you play a3, basically what you've done is you've given a hook for your opponent to attack your king. Like, for example, in order for black to open up a file, he needs to play a5, b5, a4, b4, and then b3 in order to open a file, for sure. Because right. if they ever play the a pawn, you'll play b3, for example, uh, assuming this knight is guarded, and you can lock things up. But to get this going, this takes at least five moves in order to open you up. But if you just play one move of A3, it actually saves them two full tempos. It doesn't save them one tempo, it saves two full tempos, because I will play B4, and within one, two, and three with B4, they're opening a file. So that's a really, really important thing to just remember that like you gotta be careful pushing the pawns in front of your king, because it accelerates the opposite side casting attack against your own king. Or your opponent. Very good so, point. Uh, here, rookie one, like, just bring in your pieces, right? Um, I think Jacob Agger has the three questions, and like one of those three questions that you well, should ask in any position is like, what's the worst what place is, piece? What is my worst place piece? That's number two. That's number two. Uh, unfortunately, I don't remember number one. Number one is what are the weaknesses? Ah, yes. So what are the weaknesses? Good. And I forgot number three, actually. What is the, uh, what is my opponent's idea? Yeah. Uh, so our weaknesses. The king. That's, uh, that's everybody trying to attack. My worst place piece is this rook. So bring in the rook. Now, at some point, I want to play d6. 
with some type of interference between the queen connecting with this pawn and go for main. So seeing that d6 is a threat at some point, uh, you play bishop e7. Now, Dude. I don't play d6 yet uh, because I think he can get away with d6. Yeah, he can. That's stupid. He really can. That's so dumb. And this is where... And he's about to castle, too. He's about to be out of there. This is where the silent move um, comes in. Silent. Let's get him in the chat. Get him in the chat. Hold up. Let's get them silence in the chat. Get them silence in the chat. Okay. So it's a silent move, huh? It is a silent move. Very silent. Shh. What is it, Jack? Based on Judah game, I would say F5. Are you talking about pawn or queen f5, Dr. Shane? So. Bishop takes from Savage. King b1 and he's done. Ooh, nice. That was nice, Phantom Mass Closure. Pawn f5 from Dr. Shane Saw. In fact, you're close. It is f5, but what is it, Fishner? It is queen f5. Sheesh. So the purpose of queen f5 is it exposes the rook against the pawn, and now we're threatening queen take pawn here. Also, this queen is unguarded. So uh, one of the quotes that my coach taught me when I was younger was unguarded pieces are magnets for tactics, or magnets for bad things about to happen. Like undefended pieces are magnets for bad things about to happen. And they're just magnets for some type of tactic about to happen. Like, now, also, my queen is unguarded. I will not lie and say, like, I don't realize that. But there is definitely some type of idea if we take that six. Maybe on a good day, I can do rook takes, king takes, on check, and then take this queen. So maybe on a good day, that type of tactic could happen. But there is some problem here for black. He played uh, king f8, trying to escape. Uh, so that escapes at least one pin and two pins, which makes sense. And now 94. Just because you can take something, comes back to the thing I've seen this before, just because you can take doesn't mean you have to. It's not checkers, right? Just because you can't take doesn't mean you have to take. Don't have to take the pawn. But instead, 94, bringing another piece to the attack that now is attacking the queen, also threatens this pawn with some type of sacrifice potentially if I go after here. You play 96, it's like, look, cool. You attack my queen, I attack your queen. You want to trade? No way. We take. Spink. And after knight takes e4, just because they take you, once again, you do not have to take. What's the winning move here? What's the winning move, chat? Find it. Find it. You have five seconds. What you got, chat? Hurry up. Hurry up. Hurry up. What is it? What is it? What is it? What you got? What you got? What you got? Literally, like, everything wins. Queenie six from Dr. Chainsaw. Nice job. Rook takes knight from Allen. But it is, what is it, Vishnu? It is Rook takes knight. Uh, you could probably play queen e6 as well immediately, but then knight e6 might be playable. So I, I did take immediately. And uh, I actually did take a move too soon just because you can take a yeah, take that. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, you did find the uh, Dr. Chanko, which is in the queen e6. Right. And that's it. There is just no way of stopping justification on the square. Beautiful. So, um, that was the most miniature I've had, best point move game. Uh, so that's that game. And now this next one is not my team, um, but this next one is um, why you should study tactics. Oh, yeah, and why studying tactics is important. Yeah, let's go over that one. That is, game is, that is Verona, right? Yes. Verona T. Yo, thanks, NC Mike. Thanks for the two months. My God. Verona. Let me find him. These people. Okay. Got him. Bam. There we go. So, this game, uh, now this position, uh, is probably the absolute most insane position as a calculated calculation exercise I have ever been given. Um, 
So at the time, I was working with Grandmaster Leon and Fritz as my belt. And we had a two hour lesson literally on this one position for two hours. <laughs> two I'm hours. not even kidding. We straight up spent two hours calculating here. And uh, if you want to show, James, if you want to show like how deep this analysis is. Yeah, I'm actually looking at it right now, trying to figure out what, whose move is it? It's why to move. Oh, sheesh. Boy, there's a lot going on in here. There is a lot going on. Let me turn this engine off. Yo, Latinum, thanks for the three piece. Appreciate the three piece and a biscuit. All right, hey, my guy. Sheesh. Hey, y'all, let's try to get this puzzle. This is uh, very difficult. I mean, there is so much going on. Bishop H6 takes. And now I had the engine on and it was saying everything losing. So I don't know what this puzzle is, but it was like, what did it say? Minus six? Oh no. It's only like minus one. But uh, yeah, Bishop H6 is what the engine says first, but I don't see the greatest follow up. In fact, like Bishop H6, I mean, what are you going? Knight F7? What if he just takes the knight, right? Or the bishop, I mean, he just takes the bishop. You play Knight F7, he takes, takes, Rook takes D1. Queen F8. Whoa, hold up. Bro, that's not right. Yeah, that's not right. I don't know. This one's a lot. This one is a whole lot. Well, walk us through it. What we got here, Vishnu? Because this is so ridiculous. I'm definitely not going to spend the time to on this position that it deserves. Um, if you actually look at this, and uh, there is a... The, so this book, this position is taken from the Dabaretsky Analytical Manual, which if you have read any of Dabaretsky's books, it, uh, books are extremely dense. Um, and this particular position is the first position from the uh, calculating variations for combative fireworks chapter, very first chapter in the government piano. Um, and it is literally like 10 pages of analysis on just this one position. <laughs> it looks oh, like that. it, absolutely. Because everything feels like it's losing, literally every I mean, move. I actually I don't have to move my queen, though. That's one thing I do know, is I don't have to move my queen because I can take yours. Rick takes D8. So that helps me out a little bit. But after that, you know, my knight and bishop and rook is hanging. Like, what the heck? I mean, Dr. Shainsaw says every piece is hanging. You're right, big fella. Absolutely. Yeah, you got four. You got Everything four hanging. pieces. Yep, out you of five. Four out of five. Four great pieces, job. Dang. Great job. You you did a great job on this one, right? Four out of five pieces hanging. You did a nice job. Reason that, the reason I bring this up is actually um, I had studied this position literally like two weeks before I went to Philadelphia Open 2016. And very, very oddly, this particular pattern ended up happening very similar to the first round game, which is the best game I've ever played that I will show you uh, after this puzzle. So, this will be so you know what? Ball. And I think it's probably Bishop H6, Rook takes D6, then Knight F7. Wait, so, but there's Knight takes D6 in there. Oh, yeah, tricky, tricky. Maybe Knight F7 first? Oh, it is bishop h6. Okay. It is bishop h6 first. Now, if the king goes back to h8, obviously you can take this brook, and if brook takes, then you can take take there. And, uh, oh yeah. wait, actually, if you go, if you go there, you just take the rook. Um, you could just take bishop takes f8. Is one is and, one idea. And if rook takes, then you have knight f7. Um, oh, that's beautiful. Knight f7. Pretty. And then you can take here, and you should be. And knight h6 was made actually. Uh, yeah, Maiden this is when James is 2,500 and 99. <laughs> <laughs> 92 is Maiden, Maiden too, bro. Yeah, it's it nasty. Is you need to study your tactics for <laughs> Every single day. Tactics for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Absolutely. That's right. But that's, uh, that's crazy, bro. That's crazy. Okay. So he takes it. So that, that's the one that we like, yo, what happens here? My goodness. What is this? I don't know. Knight of seven. Check. So I'll give everyone like five minutes on this one. Um, <laughs> you gonna need this it. Is, Jeez. Yeah. So this is where I'll let the chat like figure out what to do. So I'm also gonna charge my head on this time. So I'll give you guys a few minutes on this one. This is a really interesting puzzle. Queen F7. I think it's Queen F7. Because if Queen F7. Takes, takes, we check, right? And I take on D8. Beautiful. So if queen F7, you take on D1. I take on F8. You go H5. G4, check. Queen H6, mate. Oh, nasty. So wait, wait, wait. No, he has knight G7. Queen F7. He can go knight G7 immediately, can't he? 
But I got knight g4. It's king out in the middle of the street. Rook takes, takes on g7. King looking crazy. Queen f7, I'm very tempted. Rook takes, takes on f8. Knight g7. g4, but my rook's hanging down there. So close. So freaking close, bro. Queen f7, rook takes d1. Queen takes f8, knight g7. Knight f7. King h5. g4, check. I got it out, and then I take the queen. Yes, queen f7. It's got to be. It's got to be queen f7, bro. I'm in there like swim there. Swimwear. Let's get it. That, that, that's what I was thinking. That's right, beat Savage. It's queen f7. It got to be. It got to be. That's okay, right. Now. Oh, I didn't even see that. Make you feel all good. Then they do that something you ain't never seen. That's how it happens. That's how chess is. Make you feel all good when you find it. And now you out here looking crazy again. Knight g4. Are we so close? All right, we had this. Well, we, well, all right, we still, we still here. We still in this thing. G4 takes g5. Take, take. Uh oh, maiden. Hold on. My towel senses are tingling. G4, rook takes d1, g5, king h5, that's a no. Mm. Okay, I see you. Okay, knight g4, king h5. Dang, knight g4, king h5, that's annoying. Jeez, this is how you get stuck. Love your commentary, you remind me of uh, Skepta. Hey, bro, what's up, Alvaro? Alvaro, appreciate you, man. Welcome to the stream, my guy. Or gal. Queen... Oh, wait a second. Oh, but I'm only getting the, no, I'm not down. No, I'm down. I was about to sack the queenster. Queen takes g6, play knight f7. But I'm down a piece after that line. I'm down a piece, chat. Rick f3. Yeah, Rick f3. Sound, uh, he said Rick f3 looks hard to stop. Yeah, it is hard to stop. But you hang in your whole face there, right? You know, walking up to Tyson like, hey, uppercut me right now, please. Right now. Welcome to the party. Yo. The draft Tato. Thanks for the host, man. That space blockage is one would say. Absolutely. 100% premium. Queen G7. Queen F8. Queen G8. Uh, this is a hard one, bro. This is going to take some time, y'all. All right, what is it, Vishnu? Knight G4. Okay, so King H5. So what is... What are we doing next? Like, what are we doing next, bro? Mm -mm -mm. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. F5, knight e 5 knight takes F6. Rook D3, H3. Just hopeless. Literally hopeless right now. There's f5 that's too much he's gonna hit me with check knight f2 takes g4 i don't know what are we what are we looking at what do we have here oh he's gone oh he's, he's he, he left oh he's out of here oh he's back there he is okay hmm. oh 93 okay so i saw this but this, this didn't seem like this was correct like i looked at this line like okay and What's next? Knight e3. What's next? Okay, so he takes it, right? Takes. Yeah, if, you, if you play uh, Eastern, and you're going to be. No, I didn't want to go too, too, too much deeper than that. Like, the thing I didn't want to do one of the show was that Richard Bates takes the Queen F7 idea. Because the point is, if you play uh, Rook de1 with the idea of sacrificing the knight and drawing this king for you, this unfortunately doesn't work. So if you play rookie three, if you take on e seven, for example, for king h five, rookie three, trying to come back and beat on h three. Queen d seven is a very important move by black. And if you play check, they take, you take, and king h six, and somehow black has just like managed to survive and like go full turtle mode and just hide in the cell and they'll play right here and rook here. I know Levy always says cocooning, like I just call it turtle mode. You just hide in the shell and do this, or like put the gloves up, you know, getting smarter, getting hit. Wow. And boxing, and you, you just actually are winning as a flash. Like, 
why don't you just run out of stuff to attack you with? Oh man. And if you go for um rookie three, just immediately go to kill. So if I queen d7 again, h3. Uh if rook g3, king a5, rook h3, the same sacrifice idea high again. And going back queen here, h3, king h4. Take now. Oh, sorry. Whoa, jumped in way ahead. Yes, fire on the click there. Like that. that is nuts, bro. Chess is ridiculous sometimes, chat, right? Crazy. Queen F7, bring the knight all the way back around, and you still win it. This but is then, a move. Queen F5. This is black crazy. Is, black Queen, is completely fine. Turn the engine on. Wow, black's winning. Insane. With your king on h4, you are here winning. My brain is oatmeal right now. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Dr. J is all sheep. I'm over here feeling like the same. This is crazy. Now, all of this analysis is given in Can the Rusty analytical manual. Oh, uh, wow. James, if you want to like show the whole screen and show the chat like literally how much analysis there is, but like. I, I copied and pasted this from you just copied and pasted it. it yeah hold on, I, I i take no credit for for this um but i am showing this because going through this calculation this is why like studying and calculating is so 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 important is going through this calculation exercise actually helped me and hopefully it will help you figure out the answer to the next uh, puzzle, which is um, the last one, which I'll show you, uh, is the best game I would have ever played. Um, this would probably be the best game I've ever played in my life. So, let me upload it real quick. This will what's help up? you go through that. Cool. What's up, bro? All right. Oh, shoot. Okay. We good. All right. So, tell us about this game. What is this? What's, what's going on? Uh, so this was me against uh, Major Walk, uh, who was a player, I believe, from New York. And so I was playing in the Philadelphia Open in 2016 in the under 2200 section. And I believe Major Walk was the number one seed in the under 22 section. So this is round one. I am paired I think, against him, and he is the top seed or seed number two. So he was like, real up there. He was like 2190 at the time, and I was like some low. 2000, so 2005 or something like that. Um, and he played the yeah, owl guy. And I uh, knew, okay, I'll play e5, knight e5, d4, e6, knight f3. So I knew all of this was the main line. And here, uh, the main move is bishop d4, but the other main move is b6. And uh, I had seen this before, and this is actually the start of the opening that was played in the famous short versus Kimon game where short played the awesome king walk. Oh, I didn't know so that. that. Okay. That's a that's a that's a gym right there. I didn't know that actually. So this uh, a strange variation to G6. Up until this position, this is all theory. And this was all the moves from the short Kimon game. And in that game, Black had played at this position, I believe, A5, uh, I believe was the game, the uh, move played by D1. But here he played Knight, uh, after Queen E2, he played Knight A5, attacking Bishop, and now at this point, I was on my own. So, here, um, I was just on my own trying to figure out what do I do. And when you don't know what to do and you still have pieces on the back row, right, like, I always was told by Jess Coach that, like, your pieces are like a soccer team or a basketball team, right? Like, you're not just going to have LeBron go by himself or Kobe go by himself. Although, maybe Kobe would go by himself and like <laughs> go play against the other team. But, like, you got to use every single person on your team to wake them up off the back row, right? You don't want people taking naps. You got to get the bench woken up. So, 1930, bring it, bring a piece off the back row. You took, and now uh, you got to take with the pawn. Now, which pawn do you take with? Chat, which pawn do you take with? There's always a rule here. There's a rule that, of course, rules can be broken. There's always exceptions to the rule. But it's white to move. Which way do you capture? And why? Why do you capture the way that you're capturing? R. 
NC Mike said R. I'm like, which way do you capture? He said R. R. I'm like, oh, excuse me? I'm sorry. You know what? Excuse me? NC Mike. A takes B3 from Allen. C pawn. A takes B is natural. Opening a rook up. NC Mike, you want to try that again one time? I know what you meant, but do you want to try that again, though? Just one more time. Rook pawn. That's what he meant. Okay. There, there you go. go. That's right. You're right. Capture towards the center. Three. Very nice. Chess Al. CHS dog pen. Andrew, yes, sir. C3. Uh, so ASB3, C6. Um, and now we got to develop the, the last piece of sleeping. So this rook is already good. Like, without doing anything, this rook has just become activated. So in chess, right, we learn about, like, static value. That's what you learn when you're learning the rules of chess, right? Pawn to rook one, knight to three, same with fishers, rook to five, queens are nine, and kings the game, right? But what's worth more than a rook in terms of static value or pieces of static value is the dynamic value. Like, how good is your piece in the actual given position, right? Like, what is your piece actually doing? That rook is also worth five points, but he's pretty sad. He's only defending a pawn and only got one score to go to, and this rook, without doing anything, is real happy controlling the open line. So I don't need to move this guy. I need to wake someone up who has a chess game. So either this rook on f1 or this bishop on c1. So here I play the move bishop g5, and this comes with a threat. Uh, there is a clear threat here. If black doesn't defend against this threat, uh, I'm winning some material. So does anyone know what the threat is? Pretty simple threat, chat. Pretty simple threat. Bishop to g5 threatens what? If it's white to move again, what are we going to do here? DC from NC Mike. E takes D6. E takes D6. And, and Mike is on. Mike, we are today. Mike, you all right, Mike? You okay, Mike? Said DC. ED. Yeah, he got it now. Hey, Mike, if That's you need right. something, man, let me know, big dog, okay? That's right. right. If black plays bishop d7, like a lazy move, I mean, we just take, obviously, this stand here, and if, like, bishop got five, for example, to try to bishop, develop the bishop to, like, some type of more active square, well, we're still going to take anyways, and obviously, pawn takes, your pins, can't do that one, and if queen takes, we still take on e7, and your hit on those squares, so that's a block. That's what like Leslie just gave me six. We take anyways. Takes. And now we. Now you four. Attack the queen, improves the knight. Queen back. And now a very important move, c4. Uh, there is a great chess book, by the way, called uh, Techniques of Positional Play 45 Methods, uh, Practical Methods. Gain the upper hand in chess, uh, written by an international master, Valerie Bronsnik. One of the things he talks about, actually, it's the very first positional method mentioned in the book, is a knight on b6, and this is actually something I took from Bronsnik's book and I'm including in the upcoming book uh, that I'm writing, Tournament Guidebook, Axiom Online, to Montrose. This is one of those uh, against the knight. But if your opponent has a knight on b6, the pawn on b3 and possibly even a pawn on a4, or a pawn on b3 and a pawn on c4, controls this knight. Generally, a knight belongs on c6, but if a knight is on b6, it can be controlled by these two pawns. For example, right, it can't go there, it can't obviously take the pawn, and it can't come to the important central square d5. So, for the knight to go anywhere, it has to go back to one of those two squares, but then it's going backwards before you can reroute it, and that takes time. So, this is a very important idea to understand that these pawns can play against the knight and control and restrict the movement of a knight. Another thing that's important about controlling and restricting the opponent's pieces, um, and I didn't necessarily use it in this game, but there's a famous game played by Winter against Capablanca. Uh, and in that game, Capablanca mentions that when your opponent has a piece that is out of play, the correct strategy to adopt is to play on the other side of the board. I don't do that immediately, but that is a foreshadowing to how we attack on the king side later on. But uh, when your opponent has a bad piece out of play, like this knight, your goal is to go attack on the other side of the board because simply this piece just cannot come over there to help the king. Now, that, that is a long-term meta, and we'll see how that actually happens. 
Yeah, you know, rookie eight. Okay, that moves the ruck. Knight c5. So that improves the knight, threatens to take the bishop and win a pawn, right? And the bishop goes to f5. Now, <clears throat> this move is probably the move I've spent the most time on. Actually, this move and one other move is where I spent the most time on. What's your white play here? I already see it. I already know. And I, I can see it actually because I'm looking at the text. But that was my first uh, anyway. I was like, oh, just you got to do this. And then you probably have to do that. And that's what you did there. It looks nice. I like it. What Chat, what do you do though? White to move. What are you doing? <clears throat> Bishop on f5. White to move. You got many moves here, obviously. But you want to choose correctly. What do you do? Let me turn the engine on, actually. I'm just curious. Curious. Yes, yeah. These are the choices. Nice. Rook F to D1 from Phantom Master Clinic. Okay, not bad. Not bad. A little centralization. Thanks for the follow. FTP says rookie one. Okay. Rookie one. We got Crystal EXC. We rookie one. FTP walk G4 from Allen. Allen, you right, big dog. And there you go. Okay, Andrew right behind you with G4 for the score. That's right. Yeah, G4 is it. G4 is it. Here's the bishop. It's G4. And um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that will be coming in the book is this idea of aggressive prophylaxis. Um, prophylaxis, right, is stopping your opponent's plans before they happen, right? But this idea of aggressive prophylaxis, I'm basically like saying, like, look, I don't want you to be active. I'm pushing you backwards. And unfortunately, black has to go back to the bishop here. Because if you go bishop to d6, I'll just take it. You obviously cannot come forward into my territory because it's almost square to cover. If you go to d7, the problem is if you play bishop d7, you've blocked your queen from protecting that pawn. And I think I can just be cold blooded, maybe, and take that pawn. Well, you do have bishop f8. Calculate that more. Um, now, yeah. Alan says, don't push pawns in front of your king. You know what's funny, Alan? There's always exceptions in chess. I'm going to tell you a quick story here. MVL, right? If you watched the last, I don't know, if it was some, something from Grand Chess Tour, there was a game. I can't remember who he played exactly, where he moved his knight literally eight times in the opening and still it managed to get a draw. But think about that, right? When do you move your knight eight times in probably the first 20 moves? Had to be less. It was like 16. First 16 moves, eight of them was night moves by uh, MVL. Nuts, right? Something you should never, ever do. But it was justified because of an exception. Usually, there's always an exception in chess. And here, there was an exception. G4 was the best move here, even according to the engine. Kicking back the opponent's piece because it's very, very bad. Bishop doesn't look that good. Doesn't have many squares. And so, uh, yeah, as, we see, as it demonstrates here, Bishop C8 was the move he played. He did play Bishop C8. I actually don't oh. remember what I was going to do if he played Bishop C7. He so did he, play Bishop C8. Yeah, he went Bishop C8, yeah. Now, after Bishop C8, I played the move here. Um, rookie 1. Yeah, Rookie 1. I'm going to play around. Mm -hmm. Attacks the pawn. And now, I was expecting the move uh, Bishop F8. And here, this is uh, this is the axiom point. What should white play here? I will tell you the axiom after you guys find the move. So, Chad, you can find the move, but I will tell you the axiom after that because if I tell you the axiom, then you will very likely find the correct move here. Yeah, it only makes sense to go this route. I mean, you actually have two moves to do it, but yeah, white to move, chat. How do you do it? What do we do? Black is kind of cramped. Stopping opponent's development. That's right. FTP. Right. What you got, chat? How do you how do you proceed here? 95 for Phantom Master Clendrick. That's a good move. I mean, actually, no, it's not. It's not a good move. It looks good. I'll say that. But F6 forks it. Queen D2 from Furry Footed. 
Queen D2. You can use the command, my ass. Isn't the rule of pushing pawns in front of the king is that it should be only done when the center is blocked? With opponent can't make use of the exposed king. Yes, that's actually a great point, Savage. All right, here we go. What you got, Vishnu? So it was queen e3. With the uh, same queen idea. D2, with queen d2, also the same idea. And uh, the action for this one is one move queen moves are notoriously difficult to find. So um, I mentioned uh, National Master Chris Tulum was one of my friends. Like, he, had told, um, he had told me about the idea of preparing for your opponents before games. He also had told me about this idea. Like He mentioned this to me in passing one time that like one move queen moves are notoriously hard to find. I thought that was a really odd oddly specific thing and ever since he told me that i was like yeah i always remember that i should remember i pulled out my phone and wrote it in my apple notes and that ended up being one of the things i put in the book and that this is exactly a perfect example of that and the reason one of the queen moves are hard to buy is that you think of the queen as such like this grand piece that can move and shift right it's like this heat seeking missile right we we saw just talk about that on the stream before and go from one side of the board to the other within just a couple of moves. But these like silent queen moves helps extend the influence of the queen on like a new set of diagonals, right? Like suddenly the queen is helping on this diagonal. Okay, obviously it's not attacking a seven, but it is helping the pawn of the knight. But it also does help on this diagonal, help the bishop. And there's two ideas. One is to play bishop h6. Maybe I'll trade this card for bishop. Another is maybe I'll drop back to f4 and be annoying against this queen on c7. And I wasn't necessarily sure which way I'd go. I wanted to see what my opponent would do here. And at this point, my opponent played knight to d7. And this is where I want you guys to recall the previous position and find the best move. This, move, this is probably this, why. This is, this is some nice stuff I would right say here. This is my best game. Sheesh. This is very, very similar to the move that we saw in the previous puzzle. The love took uh, over and over game. Why to move? Think outside the box here and inside the box. What you gonna do? Why to move, big fella? Come on, chat. What you got? I know a lot of y'all gonna say the obvious move. Let's see who first to say it. What's up, BCD? What's good? 96 from Allen. 96, what else, chat? H4 from Phantom Master Clendrick. Bishop E7, 96 from Big Mike. Hello, Canteen Guest. What's up, Chess Boy RD? Sheesh, that's right. In fact, yo, Allen and NC Mike got it right. Bishop a6 is too easy. Correct. Yeah, that's why I, I kind of threw y'all off there and wanted to let y'all know. It's not what you're probably expecting, which is bishop h6. 96 is what this man played. Sheesh. 96. Big boy move from a big fella. 96. Yeah, I would say this is probably the best move I've played. I just remember like looking at my opponent at this point, and he did not see this move. Staring at him real hard. 96. <laughs> real hard stare. Stared real hard. Yeah. Um, that is always a very great feeling when you get to do that. But the point is, okay, so uh, if bishop takes, um, I think if you just take, like, what's wrong with just rook takes? Like, can't you just lose? Yeah, you just this? losing. Yeah, that's just gross. Yeah, bishop takes e7. So, I don't, don't think you can do that. No problem, if, FTP. 96, though. So, okay, if he moves his queen, I was probably just going to take this bishop and just be up material. Um, and that's I mean, where weaknesses for, it's for, for, probably bad i mean if here maybe even c5 is an idea because then if you move the queen i have knight c7 yikes in fact where you don't have any moves queen b4 and then rook a4 and then the queen's trap oh yeah oh gosh yeah i didn't even see that one. Oh, this somehow, is gross that's that's bad absolutely gross and if you go back now i play bishop oh Rocky my goodness and... it's a family channel sheesh give me everything thank you so he took now I took, and now if he plays king h8, which is what happened, if he plays king g7, this line is just absolutely, the, I actually saw this during the game. Uh, and this is why it comes back to the whole joke here. Oh, game. Yep. Now yeah, I remember this. It's h6, baby. Oh, my goodness. 
Snapsters, and then finale. Oh my goodness, Queen F7, beautiful. Queen F7, beautiful. Queen F7. Silent. Put that in the chat, please. Silent. This very importantly cuts the king off from escaping, and there really is no defense. If, for example, knight F6, now we play G5. The king must come up, and the final crushing move is not to take the knight. But there is the very strong move. Rookie four. Actually, is it rookie four here? Yeah, rookie it is four rookie looks four. great. Yeah, rookie four at the version. And this takes uh, an overload. The knight has to guard this pawn. Because the point is I want to play rookie four with me. If you take my then I play takes. And, and queen uh, takes. H6, yeah. GG. So that's not good. And so King G7, unfortunately, would just lose to Bishop H6. Well, fortunate for me, not going white. So right. That's all good. King H8, and now once again, Queen F7. Queen D8 to defend this book. And here I missed the best move. Um, the move I played in the game is D5 with the simple idea of D6, and I just take care of this pin and pin this way again. You also threatening Bishop D2 and C3. Bishop I, did not even, I did not even think about this idea. It's a very strong um, one. You can assume the knight in the g5, knight e6. It's gross. It's very bad. I bishop d2, bishop g7, knight g5, rook f8. Yeah, uh, it's still, but it, it's still a lot going on. But yeah, what was the best move here, actually? Knight h4? Best, I don't know. Best move is actually to play rook e6. Oh, that's crazy. Oh, that's Black crazy. Is, Absolutely paralyzed. Like, for example, if you play a random move mm, like mm, a5, now knight h4. Sack, oh, sack first, then knight h4. Takes, and now knight h4, and there's no decent Sheesh. defense to this move. Good, disgusting. Wow. Let me do an air horn for that one. <laughs> Bruh. Wow. Uh, thank you, NC Mind, for saying it's a beautiful game. I did not play as. Brilliantly there. I found 96. I found the first few moves. Did not find the final few moves, and that's why I got a big attack. So, uh, this would not be my immortal. But that's why D5 was played. Uh, and then Ricky 6 comes in, he was the best man. So, point obviously, point on the floor. So, after D5, this is also where they play D6 and just crush, crush through this way, right? We got all kinds of things going on. Fix takes. And after Mr. G7, Based on the seven, eight, six. Now we're attacking this. And now rookie eight simplifies into game everything. So clock by nine of eight. We take. And now we use this pin on the other side to go after the bishop. He shot bishop g4, and took a rook. And now he sets. The pawn is very strong. Dang, there's so First many design. moves left too. That's crazy how so many y'all got yeah, y'all went a long time. There's like another 20 moves from here. What he do? Oh he gave up the material and tried to go for this type of position. Um one of my co coaches always told me the kiss rule, K I S S, keep it simple, silly. Mm -hmm. Just sacrifice when you need to to trade down and to win the end game. And that's exactly what I did. I played rook jack. I took the good shots. And Take objectively, the not the best one. Best way. This is objectively. Computer would definitely disagree with this, but that's the thing. Sometimes you just gotta not go in the engine mode. You just have to do what is the simplest way to play the position, right? Uh, yeah, you right. just gotta do what is the simplest thing to play, and it's just rook here, takes, takes, and rook takes. And now hitting that, and if the bishop moves, so you're gonna lose that pawn. Take the, the other pawn. one. Everything must go. Thank you. Step on, and that's it. The end game at this point is it's just, just winning. Mop up, and now it's time to push the last guy. Mop Check. Okay, don't lose the B pawn. Push pawn. Push and sacrifice. Speak. Thank and you. Cover. Easy. Nice. Beautiful. That beautiful. That so, 96 was a great move there. That was the uh, key move was back here, right? Uh, finding this move 96. And that's why studying that low trick and burn over game really helped out. It was uh, kind of seeing those ideas and synthesizing it together. And this is why you need to study tactics, right? Like, 
cutting taxes will help your creativity and ideas kind of come together. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's a few of the teasers on the upcoming book. I am looking forward to uh, publishing. I have found a publisher, um, so I will give more details on that a little bit later. But um, yes, I have found a publisher. The book should be coming out by early 2022, um, maybe five to ten puzzles away from completing the book. So uh, yeah, really excited and happy to finish this out and uh, yeah, have this book be, be out there so that you guys can uh, take a look and enjoy it. Yeah, it's actually uh, great to have you, Vishnu. As as uh, usual, man, he's always in the stream, guys. Everything we drop usually for the, especially if y'all on the YouTube, make sure you subscribe. Is uh, we have our our uh, tournament guidebook video, basically format for y'all to follow the book, especially when it drops. Y'all already have it just for more visuals and stuff like that. And the final question, I think, is by Alan, eighty uh, thirteen. What's my favorite method of learning tactics? My favorite book. Um, there was a book by Angela Lean, L E I N. I probably looked at the pronunciation of that name. Uh, that's one book I really liked. Uh, I also liked The Thousand and One Ascendants by Fred Reinfeld. Those were the books when I read when I was younger. But at the current point, honestly, my favorite way of training tactics uh, number one, chess.com, uh, Puzzle Rush for sure. Do Puzzle Rush, um, just get fast. The thing about Puzzle Rush, I find, is it's really good for getting like. Your, I think Puzzle Rush, in terms of, like, if you had to compare Puzzle Rush to, like, basketball, it's like doing layups. That's what basketball, I tell students, yeah, all the time. It's literally doing layups. Mm -hmm. Basketball, like, that is the exact comparison to Puzzle Rush and chess. You, you're doing a ton of layups or everything. That's your Puzzle Rush. But as far as actually training for tournaments and doing tactics, my personal favorite website is actually chesspo.com, P-E-M-P-O.com. System. I just personally have found those puzzles. Um, I got that shout out to Grandmaster Julio Sidmora from the Philippines. Um, Julio is the one that introduced me to that website. But uh, the reason I use that is because all of those puzzles are taken from real street, like real games. Uh, so like if you go through those puzzles, they are significantly harder, in my opinion. Like I think the chess.com ratings personally are slightly inflated, like a 50,000 rated puzzle, it's slightly higher than what? Chest tempo, death lap, death by lactose. Yeah, uh, chest, T-E-M-P-O. Uh, you like, my chest tempo rating is probably like 1800. Like, it makes me feel bad about myself, which is good, because that means like, you know what, hey, my actual rating is higher, my chest tactics rating is lower, like I need to work on my tactics. That's what it tells me. So it gives me motivation to keep working. Um, so that's why I would highly recommend that you use that website. Um, and that's why I tell my students to use to train. If they're really trying to train on their tactics to like actually get better at calculating. But as far as like the quick, quick speed and the quick um, layup type of thing and the quick type of training, I would highly suggest the chess.com puzzle rush because that's the way that you warm up. But then once you're warm, if you're really trying to tap the strain and really improve your calculating ability, that is, um, that would be the last thing. Any final questions for me? Because I'm about to like get off in the next five minutes. I mean, like, I'll take two more questions if there are any. Love you, chat. Thanks, everybody. This was awesome. Let's see if we got any questions left. For the man. Can you speed run us through an Alvin Calder Cabinet again? Oh, that would be uh next That's gonna time. be for, yeah, that's gonna be for next time. All right. Next time. When is Mike Kennedy's birthday? Uh July sixth. Thank you very much, Phantom Master Clundry. Thank you very much. I'll answer that one. Take one more question. Here's one. Any advice for finding the right opening? Yeah. Um, honestly, I would recommend uh, there is a website called Chess Mood, M O O D. 
Uh, shout out to Grandmaster Abhijit Gregorian and his team for helping me significantly with the creation of this book. Obviously, with James and several others, I did not include Abhijit in the original intro for helping me a lot. But that um, that would be where uh, there's an article on their blog on how to select the right opening for you. But one thing I would suggest is like you really should pick openings based on openings where you have similar pawn structures because the thing is pawns are the soul of chess so if you understand pawn structures and you understand middle game plans if you pick openings where your pawn structures are very very similar you just have to study less so that would be the advice i would give i'm not going to necessarily say pick one opening because i play it or james plays it like that's you have to pick something that's right for you everyone has a different style like, I would never touch this before I'll let James play it, just because I don't believe it's sacrificing a pawn that quickly. But James can prove me and many others wrong that <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> like, it's just not my style. So you have to play stuff. Like, I, I suggest as many as like 15, 1800, play whatever, whatever opening you want and just get a style and develop your style. And then at that point, like, figure out, like, okay, what. Kind of positions do you like more or what do you like less and then actually go study something and try to pick other openings that fit with the similar type of font structures very good very good well Vishnu, i think that was wonderful i think everyone enjoyed it they're like yo when is he coming back right so we definitely gonna have him back on obviously um thanks thanks for coming man thanks for writing a book obviously too and have a, blessing us with the content that we have more stuff be a better one Maybe. watch the videos and stuff too May, maybe 50th video. How about that? Oh. <laughs> Once we get to 50. A 50? Yeah, 50. You talking about 50, uh, 50 videos? Yeah, 50 we can do videos. It. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, we are like 30 now, maybe 32, something like that. Sweet. Sweet. There's one more question in here. Last one. Uh, have you guys ever set up the pawns and turn on and place the pieces where you think they should and kept it against the opening position? I have not done that. I have, I have not. Done. I have never done that. I, I have not done that. One interesting thing I heard, though, um, Abate put this in his chessmove.com blog. In order to memorize opening variations, one thing I found was very interesting that he suggested. Find his sparring partner and play the position as if black moves first. So say black plays pawn e4, but actually plays e5 first, and switch the colors and try playing that first, where black goes first. Uh, the mirroring effect oddly helps you memorize openings and see the same opening from a different point of view. Right. So that could be something to try. Oh, that was a question for chat. Oh, yeah, we didn't even know that. But, but I mean, oh, question for the chat. Oh, okay. But maybe, yeah, you know, it could be two ways. But yeah, uh, that that's uh that's a wrap there. Thanks so much, y'all. Look, that was awesome. Thank you for having me on. Man, hey, good for being on, my guy, Vishnu Warrior. Make sure you guys subscribe to the YouTube. I appreciate that. Thanks for watching. You know, we dropping this for y'all to watch. We're gonna have more videos. Hope y'all enjoyed it today and learned a lot. Right. And uh Vishnu is a new dad, man. So you gotta get back to the baby and stuff, right? Understand. Yep. So cool, y'all. Thank y'all, man. Thank you. Yeah, I'm getting off too, bro. I'll be back on tomorrow, y'all. So I'll be back on. Um, tomorrow i got to do some some commentary tomorrow so i'll be you know up early so i'm gonna see y'all tomorrow as well thanks for the bits today thanks for the love thanks for the subs thanks for all that awesomeness and all that energy y'all bring i appreciate y'all love you and i'll see y'all on the next one